of coming home, and that is Bishop David Zelmer. And then if you would remain standing, we will pledge our allegiance to our nation's flag. A reading from Deuteronomy. Choose from each of your communities individuals who are wise, discerning, reputable to be your judges. And Moses said to his judges, give the members of your community a fair hearing and judge rightly between one person and another, whether citizen or resident alien. You must not be partial in judging. Hear out the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have gifted us with the law, and we have set aside these wise and discerning men and women to be judges over us. Bless their discerning and judgments that they might be fair and equitable to both the small and the great. We pray for our Chief Justice Gilbertson, the Supreme Court Justices, all our judges and magistrates who serve in South Dakota. We ask at this time that we would remember those who go in harm's way to keep us safe, especially those who serve in law enforcement and we remember particularly those who have died in keeping us safe. Bless as well our governor, our senators, and representatives, and all those who have been set aside to serve. In your holy name we pray, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Secretary, will you please call the roll of the Senate? Senators Bradford, Here. Brown, Buell O'Donnell, Kamak, Kurd, Ewing, yep. Frerichs, Here. Greenfield, Hager, Haverly, Heinemann, Heinert, Holine, Hanoff, Jensen, Lederman, Monroe, Nordstrup, Olson, Abdahl, Lawton, Parsley, Peters, Peterson, Rampelberg, Rave, Rush, Sohold, Solano, Sutton, Tiedemann, Teason, Van Gerpen, Valley, and White. Quorum present, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Will the clerk please call the roll of the House of Representatives, please? Representative Anderson, Bartling, Beal, Bolin, Bordeaux, Bruner, Campbell, Consett, Craig, Cronin, Deutsch, DeSanto, Dryden, Duvall, Feichert, Gibson, Gosh, Greenfield, Hager, Harrison, Hogard, Hawks, Holly, Heinemann, Hickey, Holmes, Hanahawk, Hunt, Jensen, Johns, Kaiser, Killer, Kirschman, Plum, Langer, Lateral, Marty, May, McCleary, Mickelson, Munsterman, Nordstrup, Otten, Partridge, Peterson, Palm, Rasmussen, Ring, Romkama, Rounds, Rosam, Russell, Schaefer, Schoenbeck, Shanefish, Shrimp, Sly, Soley, Solem, Stalzer, Stevens, Tolson, Vercio, Werner, Westra, Wick, Willitson, Wolman, Zickman, Speaker Wink. Mr. Speaker, a quorum is present. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, quorum of the joint session is affirmed. Would you please read the motions, Madam Secretary? Senator Rave moves that a committee of three on the part of the Senate and a committee of five on the part of the House be appointed to escort the Honorable Dave, David Gilbertson, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, to the rostrum. All those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion carried. The committee, as announced, is comprised of Senators Brown, Raven, Sutton, and from the House, Representatives Gosh, Westra, Mickelson, Hawley, and Bartley. Ladies and gentlemen, a number of years ago, the Chief Justice asked to speak and give a state of the judiciary to you as a joint session. We are honored and privileged today to have the Chief Justice present. Chief Justice Gilbertson was elected to a four-year term as Chief Justice by the members of the Supreme Court in September 2004, was re-elected to a second fourth term by the other members of the Supreme Court in 2005, and a third four-year term in June 2000, excuse me, in June 2013. He was appointed to the Supreme Court in 1995 and obviously has been retained by the voters in each successive let, uh, vote. Chief Justice Gilbertson received his undergraduate degree from South Dakota State University and his Juris Doctorate from the University of South Dakota School of Law. He was engaged in the practice of law from 1975 until his appointment in 1986. And he served as a circuit judge in the Fifth Circuit from 1986 until his appointment in 1995. 
In 2007, he was the recipient of the Distinguished Service Award from the National Center for States Courts for his defense of judicial independence. He was the recipient of the Grassroots Award by the American Bar Association in 2014, also for his defense of judicial independence. Since 2010, he has served as a state representative on the Criminal Rules Committee of the United States Court. And more importantly is this last piece, in my estimation, that we sometimes think that we cannot be national leaders because we come from a small state. Well, indeed, again, like many of our leaders here and other places are indeed national leaders. In July, the chief will become the president, the president of the Conference of Chief Justices for the entire nation. An organization made up of chief justices of all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the Pacific Islands. He will also serve concomitantly as the chair of the board of directors of the National Center of State Courts for that same time period. Mr. Sergeant at Arms, would you please announce the arrival of the Chief Justice? Bishop Zelmer, thank you for that wonderful invocation. Governor Dugard, Lieutenant Governor Michaels, Speaker Wink, members of the legislature, constitutional officers, my fellow justices, judges, unified judicial system employees, and all citizens of the state of South Dakota. These are exciting times. In its 125th year, the state's judicial system, officially known as the unified judicial system, continues to move forward on many fronts. Some projects are well on their way to successful completion. Others, such as the 2013 criminal justice reforms and the rural attorney recruitment program, enjoyed their first full year of existence. For projects to succeed, we need three things. You need a solid plan, you need a solid team, and you need the expertise to deal with the challenge. And I believe the UJS possesses all three. This is a far cry from the observation of the political humorist Will Rogers on the performance of a previous president. Will Rogers said, the country wanted nothing done, and he done it. <laughs> uh, clearly, the citizens of South Dakota want something done. They want problems addressed, and the UJS is honored to do so. Alcohol and drug addiction are not among the list of items kids ask for on their birthday wish list. Addiction is also not on the bucket list of things people want to do or experience before they die. While addiction is not forced on a person, neither is addiction a knowing, voluntary, and intelligent choice at the beginning of that sad path. To address addiction, one DUI court graduate noted, you don't get sober without divine intervention. My divine intervention showed up in the squad car. Uh, the notion that this state can jail itself out of addiction problems has proved untenable. We now have 18 months of experience under the new concepts, which are generically referred to as alternative sentencing. A brief review of why they were enacted is helpful. In December 2013, a study by the Pew Foundation showed that for the previous five years, South Dakota's crime rate rose at a greater rate than any other state in the nation. 
This statistic is more alarming when one considers that only five of the 50 states experienced any increase in their crime rate at all. 45 states did not. Of the five states experiencing an increase, South Dakota had the dubious distinction of leading the list with a 20% increase. At the same time, we tied with Alabama for having the fourth largest percentage increase in prison population. This increase was 5% and a clear validation that more people in prison does not equal less crime outside of prison. What South Dakota proponents for alternative sentencing had been advocating since our first drug court program started in 2008 was verified statistically by numbers showing that South Dakota was heading for a financial cliff. The Crime in South Dakota report for 2013 informed us that drug arrests were up 40% from the previous year and drug use had a ripple effect in other areas of crime. Aaron McGowan, the state's attorney for Minnehaha County said, in my experience, roughly 70 to 80% of our serious crime is chemically propelled. This includes illegal drugs, prescription drug abuse, and alcohol abuse. Drug and DUI courts continue to expand since this legislature passed the Public Safety Improvement Act in 2013. Our history is a positive one in the area of expansion of these programs. From 2008 to 2014, 302 clients have been accepted statewide into South Dakota's drug and DUI courts. These are not mere numbers. Had all of these people gone directly to the penitentiary, the cost to the state would have been substantial because of direct incarceration costs, DSS costs to support children due to the inmates' incarceration, and health care costs to both. In fiscal year 2014 alone, the taxpayers were saved the expense of 55,000 potential prison days, which were all sentenced by a judge, but not served by the addict or paid for by the taxpayers. If one calculates that figure times the cost of $62.50 a day for penitentiary incarceration, there's a potential savings of nearly $3.5 million for just fiscal year 14 alone because of drug and DUI courts. In 2013, 247 children were not placed with DSS because of their parents' alternative sentences. The average cost for placement of each child with the Department of Social Services, assuming no special needs, is $10,000 per year per child. Last June, I spoke at the first DUI court graduation in Aberdeen. Prior to graduation, I, along with Justice Wilbur, had the opportunity to privately visit with the three graduates and get to know them. Each one of them told us their life story. One looked me in the eye and blurted out, if it if were not for this program, I would be dead by now. Another graduate said, this program has given me the tools to be an example for my family instead of an embarrassment. Another graduate at another graduation said, drug court teaches you to live in society and stay clean. Prison cannot do that. It is clear their life experiences, along with successful participation in this program, have provided them with the hard-earned, profound knowledge, and I mean it is profound knowledge, on how to succeed in life. This is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. Instead, it's the law of the second chance, but nevertheless, a criminal law with serious consequences for failure in this program, that being a penitentiary sentence. These successful graduates are proof that our programs not only save money and reduce crime rates, they instill a sense of personal responsibility. These individuals are examples of the observation of President Ronald Reagan that we must reject the idea that every time a law is broken, society is guilty rather than the lawbreaker. He said it's time to restore the American precept that each individual is accountable for his or her actions. While our current programs show positive signs of success, they do not guarantee total or immediate success. A person is not weaned from addiction to drugs or alcohol overnight. 
however, to continue to do business as usual, as we had done prior to the passage of the Public Safety Improvement Act, was a guarantee of continued expensive failure. We also can draw from the experience of dozens of other states who have lowered their crime rates while reducing their cost of incarceration by alternative sentencing. In 2014, the report of the Public Safety Improvement Act Oversight Council of South Dakota sums up a significant benefit to South Dakota from the enactment of the act. That report said, had the Public Safety Improvement Act not occurred, the forecast for South Dakota would be significantly different. The state would be in the process of building two new prisons. The estimated cost, depending on the size of these prisons and uh, whether they were maximum or minimum or medium security, could be up to a quarter of a billion dollars. Whatever amount it was, none of this is being spent on prison construction at this time due to the assistance of these programs. Several thousand years ago, the biblical prophet Isaiah asked, who shall I send? Who shall go for us? Back came the response, which is fitting to those who are in our all-volunteer military services. Here am I, send me. We send them to defend us in harm's way and put their lives on the line for us. Since 1990, veterans have returned to us in large numbers. President Lincoln defined our obligation to them in his second inaugural address. He said, it is our duty to care for him who shall have borne the battle. For all too many veterans, the stress of combat was not left behind, but brought home. It is a constant companion which sadly affects their lives. For some, it brings them into our criminal justice system through self-medication by the abuse of alcohol or drugs. It also manifests itself through assaults, DUIs, or domestic violence. Unless we successfully address the underlying problem instead of only the criminal charge, we accomplish nothing more than warehousing people for a period of time in jail. They are released untreated to repeat that same sad cycle. This is not a battle they win. On July 7, 2014, Coddington County became the first county in South Dakota to implement a veterans court. Circuit Judge Robert Tim leads a dedicated group of volunteers who seek to successfully provide treatment to the veteran who has come into our court system. Participation in the program is voluntary. If accepted into the program, a veteran agrees to a regimen which includes a weekly appearance in court, frequent meetings with court service officers, and compliance with a Veterans Administration plan of treatment. To provide this treatment, we have partnered with the South Dakota Veterans Administration which has been enthusiastic about full participation in the project. At the time of the completion of the program, we hope veterans will be able to put the demons behind them that came home with them. At the end of the Civil War, Lincoln said, thank God I have lived to see this day. It seems to me that I have been dreaming a horrid dream for four years, and now that nightmare is gone. Hopefully, veterans who complete this program will be able to say the same. We hope to use the Coddington County program as a model for implementing veterans courts in the rest of the state. As I mentioned earlier, 2014 was the 125th birthday of South Dakota and its judicial system. What better way to commemorate this anniversary than with a program such as this? It's better than a statue, a plaque, or another inanimate object. It is a living memorial. To make a long story short, as was said 2,000 years ago, their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. Drug and alcohol courts require a treatment component that is not always available in rural areas of South Dakota. Yet, drug and alcohol programs are as serious there as in our urban areas. To address this rural problem, we piloted a HOPE program in Walworth County this year. It has gotten off to an excellent start. 18 people are enrolled in the program. Each faced prison time for drug offenses or other felonies which were the result of drug use. 
After an evaluation, the participants accepted into the program are required to call in each day to find out if they are subject to random testing that day. Failure to show up for testing or testing dirty results in jail time to reinforce the negative consequences of failure to follow the rules of the program. Participants are also heavily monitored by a specially trained court service officer. To date, we've had three people successfully complete the program. All spoke highly of the value of the program to their personal lives. Circuit Judge Scott Myron, who originated the program, Riley told me it's a low dollar deal. Beyond the UJS personnel, the only cost to the state is a minimal drug testing cost. Thus, 18 people who would have been in the penitentiary at taxpayer expense are instead remaining in their home community and participating in this program. In fiscal year 2015, we will expand the HOPE program to Aberdeen, Sioux Falls, and Winter. There is a certain comfort level when you proceed with a plan that's worked in the past. At a minimum, you know it takes some of the uncertainty out of the situation. As we know, all three branches of South Dakota state government, plus many distinguished South Dakotans, came together to address the problem of alternative sentencing for adults. With that planning process successfully behind us and the programs authorized by the Public Safety Improvement Act now up and running, the same uh, study process is looking at how we deal with juveniles in our court system. All three branches of state government are cooperating in this endeavor. There's a saying that if you're driving down the road and see a turtle on top of a fence post, you know it got there with some help. These goals are the same as we had with the adults in the Public Safety Improvement Act, to hold the youthful offenders more accountable, improve public safety, and save the taxpayers money. We have the second highest per capita commitment rate of juveniles of any state in the nation. For too long, our circuit judges have had basically two alternatives, either place the juvenile on probation, which may not give sufficient oversight, or send the juvenile to a state institution, a drastic alternative. There is no middle ground, especially in the rural areas of the state. A year at the Star Academy in Custer for one juvenile exceeds the cost of housing three adults for that year and maximum security in our penitentiary. We are hopeful that the statewide implementation of the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, commonly referred to as JDAI, is a promising start in the reduction of these high numbers. Early last year, Governor Dugard and I met and reviewed the success of the 2013 Public Safety Improvement Act. While this act is limited to adults, it was clear to both of us that many of the same problems plagued our current juvenile justice system. We agreed to proceed in a similar manner to study the problem by bringing together all the major South Dakota players in the juvenile justice system. That study group, after much work, authored a fine report which became the basis for a legislative proposal which this legislature will be asked to consider this session. The governor outlined the goals of the proposal yesterday. It is not my task to repeat them, but I want to let you know that I also feel this proposal has the potential to improve our existing juvenile system to a significant extent by the reallocation of dollars and services, chief among them, is not only to treat the troubled juvenile, but the juvenile's family, which is all too often <clears throat> It's all too often the juvenile's family, not a part of the solution, but really a part of the problem. The family needs to become part of the solution and not remain part of that problem. With all of the branches of government and experts combining their experience and foresight, we can produce a proposed solution which merits serious consideration. In 2014, the UJS experienced the most significant increase in supervision of persons placed on felony probation in its history. During this year, the number of people supervised at some time during the year climbed to 7,148. 
The numbers for the past five years provide an interesting picture. Compare the number of people on probation who were sent to the penitentiary for serious violations of probation with those who either successfully completed or remained on probation. For example, in 2010, we had 4,824 people on probation. That year, 7% were violated and sent to the penitentiary. Every year since 2010, the number of people on probation has gone up to the current 7,148 figure I talked about. Yet the number sent to the penitentiary for violation percentage-wise has dropped from the 7% now down to 4.4%. The number of people on felony probation this past year did increase by 1,250 people. With the additional resources provided by the governor and this legislature, we were able to hold the revocation rate down to that same low rate as the year before, an all-time low of the 4.4%. We were also able to continue to provide taxpayers with not only effective, but cost-effective supervision at a cost of $3 per day per probationer. The cost of penitentiary incarceration is about $62.50 a day. <coughs> On the portico of the United States Supreme Court building are carvings of great history's great lawgivers. Central is Moses holding the Ten Commandments. The Fifth Commandment is, Honor thy father and thy mother. On July 24, 2014, the headline in our largest state newspaper read, Guilty Plea theft from grandmother of $62,000. The grandmother was 89 and suffered from dementia. One might think this sad, but unusual. Unfortunately, national experts tell us the only thing that is unusual about this case is that the thief got caught. Most abuse of the elderly, whether it be physical, emotional, or financial, goes unreported. In fact, only one in 14 cases are reported nationally when it occurs in a domestic setting. While we see television commercials daily showing that anonymous criminal preying on a senior over the phone or the internet, sadly, 90% of these crimes are perpetrated by someone within the victim's family. Often a victim can be abused in more than one manner. It is not just a family dispute over family funds. We must recognize it for what it is, felony theft. As to physical abuse, it is also a crime and may also be a felony. A federal study concluded that elder abuse can occur in any community and involve seniors in any socioeconomic, racial, or ethnic group. Two-thirds of the victims are women. This issue has been called the silver tsunami. If so, this is only the first wave. Several factors combine to result in a growing problem. The most obvious is the number of senior citizens is increasing. By 2025, there will be more Americans over the age of 65 than there will be in grade school. Not only are there more of us, but we are living longer. When Social Security was implemented in the 1930s, a retirement age of 65 was selected because the life expectancy was only 66. I would guess today that most adult South Dakotans probably know at least one person who has reached the age of 100. In former decades, seniors moved in with their adult children. The family home commonly housed three generations. Now a senior may not have a spouse or any adult children. If there are adult children, they may live anywhere in the world instead of next door. This situation is due to increased mobility, divorce, declining birth rates, increased lifespans, and other factors which have done away with the family stability of former years. There are many factors fueling the rapid increase in financial crime against seniors. Seniors are the fastest growing segment of our population and are where the money is. This generation is known to be a trusting generation. There is a lack of oversight for seniors who either live at home or are assisted by paid caregivers or who live in a long-term care facility. Moreover, often the thief or the abuser is the caregiver and the senior is worried about losing independence by the caregiver's arrest because 
that would result in the senior being placed in a nursing home for lack of another alternative. Now, it's not my purpose today to bash caregivers. The vast majority do their job in a compassionate and honest manner. My father was able to avoid nursing home care for many years solely because of a dedicated individual who cared for him to the end of his life. In an effort to determine more accurately if South Dakota had a problem in this area, and if so, to what extent, a few years ago, I polled South Dakota's judges to find out their experiences with senior abuse. About half the judges identified the issue as rare or only see about one case a year. However, on the other half, they indicated that they had seen instances of improper management of assets by guardians, personal representatives of an estate, joint tenants, a relative, a family friend, a power of attorney, or an attorney at law. One judge mentioned concern over improper solicitation of incapacitated seniors for what were purported to be religious contributions. Another judge described the abuse she had witnessed as horrendous. Yet another mentioned a power of attorney, quote, improperly cleaned her out in 60 days, $400,000. One judge sadly concluded, blood is thicker than water. Money is thicker than blood. If there is good news in the survey, it is that none of the judges saw evidence of physical abuse of seniors who came before them. However, the judges cautioned that if a senior had been physically abused, it was highly unlikely that the perpetrator would be foolish enough to bring the senior into the courtroom. Several judges added that they saw more of this type of misconduct when they were practicing law than after they became a judge. The bottom line is that the abuse of seniors exists in South Dakota, although the extent of the abuse is unknown. This issue is a major cause for concern of all of us. It is worthy of a partnership between the three branches of this government, similar to what we did to secure the passage of the Public Safety Improvement Act. The problem needs to be addressed in a coordinated, not a piecemeal manner. The unified judicial system stands ready to work on such a project. For a town to survive, it uh, must maintain a certain infrastructure. This is more than buildings with signs indicating the building is a church, a school, a grain elevator, or a place of business. Those by themselves are simply buildings. It is the ability of the community to provide its citizens and those who live near it with the basic services to maintain the community as a community. This infrastructure is maintained and enhanced by the presence of an attorney or attorneys in the community. All too many of our towns once provided legal services, but these services have withered with the passage of the years. A partnership of the three branches of this government seeks to restore legal services to many rural communities in South Dakota. The South Dakota Rural Attorney Recruitment Program has been in effect for a little over a year. I am very pleased with the results. The Rural Attorney Recruitment Program was authorized by the legislature. It seeks to assist rural counties in South Dakota that need access to local attorneys and assist between an attorney located in that county. It is a partnership between the county, the state, and the State Bar of South Dakota by providing a five-year program of financial incentives to an attorney who locates in an eligible rural county. It reminds me of the day when a friend of mine and I were watching an eagle flying majestically over our lake. My friend commented that the eagle was able to fly in such a glorious manner because its wings worked together. May 7, 2014 was a monumental day for this program. On that day, Jake Fisher became the first attorney not only in South Dakota, but the first attorney in the entire nation to enroll in such a program by opening a law office in Corsica. This came about through the cooperation of the Corsica Development Corporation and the Douglas County Commissioners. Jake was raised on a farm near Corsica, but had gone to law school in Minnesota and had practiced law in the Minneapolis area. 
The bill you passed allowed him to come home with his family and set up a law practice for his friends and neighbors in the Corsica area. To date, six counties have taken advantage of the program and now enjoy the benefits of the program. They are Douglas, Lyman, Hawken, Hand, Tripp, and Perkins counties. Eight attorneys are involved. Four are men, four are women. They say a picture's worth a thousand words, and uh, some of you may have seen our highway sign that kind of uh, attempted to uh, show what we were trying to do. And obviously, it gets the point across. Next attorney, and I think it says 125 miles. Well, nothing stays the same. It always moves forward or backward, as this program has. And so today, I'm very proud to unveil a second sign. Chris? For those of you that can't see it, it says, next attorney, up the block. <laughs> a little bit better than 125 miles. And uh, the sign has served us well. The original sign actually got in a uh, front page article in the New York Times, which brought national attention and exposure to this fine program. Other counties have shown interest and are attempting to match, uh, we are attempting to match each geographical area with a law student at the University of South Dakota School of Law or elsewhere. A few months ago, my staff and I met with 21 first and second year law students. They all had an interest in the rural law practice and their geographical interests covered virtually every portion of the state. The Supreme Court is charged with the administration of this fine program. We are willing to make on-site visits with an interested county and set up a meeting between the county's commission and law students who may be interested in that locale. We still see some of the reluctance you would find at a junior high dance. Boys on one side, girls on the other, and nobody quite sure how to make that first move. <laughs> we stress that this program is of a limited duration and that after 16 allotted slots which are allowed under the bill have been filled or five years has elapsed, the program will terminate. To wait invites the same result as an intentional decision not to participate. The result contributes to stagnation and decline. A major reason for the program's current success is the active cooperation of local attorneys in the area. Many want to retire from the full-time practice of law, but recognize their obligation to their clients and do not want to leave them without access to legal services. We are available to visit with these veteran attorneys to explain the specifics of the program and how it applies to their locale. As I mentioned, 2014 was the 125th birthday of the state of South Dakota, and it was also the 125th birthday of the state's judicial system. At one point, we hope to restore the law library of the Supreme Court to its original splendor as a fitting birthday project. We believe it's the last room in this lovely capital open to the public, which has not been restored to its original grandeur. The cost of other projects, such as the restoration of the stained glass in the building, put the law library restoration project on hold. The Supreme Court instead opted for an oral history project. Since 1889, 49 South Dakotans have served as justices on the South Dakota Supreme Court. Those not on the current court left behind legal opinions, but little else other than an eventual obituary. This oral history project provides a snapshot in time for future generations to review and study. The South Dakota Supreme Court is entrusted by the citizens of South Dakota with being the final arbiter of legal disputes in the state's court system. We literally decide issues which determine liberty and property rights, and even life itself. Yet, most citizens know little how we make these decisions, how they come about, or they know little about the five individuals who make up the South Dakota Supreme Court. For example, very few citizens know that I was a volunteer fireman for 20 years, including some of my early years on the South Dakota Supreme Court. I doubt today many of you can envision me driving a fire truck down the street, uh, but it did teach me in my time on a fire department 
the value of teamwork, a vital lesson for later leading a judicial system. The 2014 uh, project included interviews with all five current Supreme Court justices. They sat for individual oral interviews to allow the public to get to know them as individuals and how they undertake their duties. To add additional historical background, all former living justices of the Supreme Court have been interviewed about their time on the court. Additional context has been provided by interviews with three veteran attorneys who gave their perspective of the court's history. This project provides a permanent record of the court at this 125th birthday date. It also provides information on the uh, revision of the constitutional article, Article 3, uh, in 1972 and the court's history since that time. Funding costs were kept down for this project by generous contributions from other public and private entities. Electronic filing for criminal cases began statewide on January 29, 2014, and for statewide civil cases on June 25, 2014. The use of electronic filing supports our continued efforts to move towards electronic records. On July 1, 2014, our clerk of courts offices became paperless on a statewide basis. Now courts utilize electronic records to conduct the majority of the court's business. This allows us to continue the work to allow the public access to case records through electronic means. Currently, the public can access court records through computer terminals located in, in courthouses. We will move towards electronic web-based access in 2015. Well, what does all this mean to the average person? It is a very real possibility that in 2015, an officer will issue a citation and the documents will be electronically filed with court. The judge will be able to view these documents electronically and issue a decision such as a search warrant electronically. If a fine is eventually assessed, you lucky folks who get a ticket can simply pay it online. I know that's good news for you. <laughs> Just trying to help out. <laughs> this year, the voters in three South Dakota judicial circuits elected one or more circuit judges from a field of two candidates for each judicial seat where there was a contested race. These nonpartisan elections strike a middle of the road approach by having public selection of judges. Partisan politics, however, is kept out of the process. Justice should not be rationed on the basis of politics. Three members of the South Dakota Supreme Court stood for retention elections. The justices ran on their record and the voters, by a simple yes or no vote, indicated whether each justice earned an additional term on the court. A pundit has said that the Supreme Court grades the papers of the circuit judges when an appeal occurs. This retention election was an opportunity for the voters to grade the papers of these Supreme Court justices. All three passed. With the retirement of Justice John Conenkamp at the end of 2014, Governor Dugard appointed Circuit Judge Janine Kern to fill that vacancy on the South Dakota Supreme Court. Justice Kern has been a circuit judge in the Seventh Judicial Circuit since 1996. Besides her normal judicial duties, she has participated in numerous boards and commissions dealing with legal and children's issues. She brings to the court a well-earned reputation for excellence of the performance of her judicial duties. Justice Kern is a welcome addition to our court. The importance of her selection is underscored by the fact that since we became a state in 1889, as I noted, only 49 people have served as justices on the South Dakota Supreme Court. Please help me welcome Justice Kern. Stand up.
Thus, we close the book on the first 125 years of South Dakota, but the tasks go on. Those who started our judicial system in 1889 would be dumbfounded to look at the scope of the system today as well as the problems it confronts. Those individuals in 1889 had to be optimists by nature to venture out into this land and carve a state out of it. They are gone now, but their optimistic spirit lives on. We should apply that same optimism to the challenges we face. I close with this thought. The best is yet to come. Thank you. Senator Ray moves that the joint session be dissolved. Is there a second? All those in favor of dissolution signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed nay. Motion carried. We are so dissolved. Thank you.